Thank you very much, Pastor. It's a delight to be uh, with you. Many of you were at uh, the uh, seminar last night and this morning. It's good to see you again and also to meet uh, the new friends. I, I thank Pastor Fidel for that uh, wonderful introduction. They never tell you what you really want to know about a speaker. They're always sitting there wondering how old is that guy, you know, and all the details. So I'll put your minds at rest. I will be 69 in one month, uh, so you don't have to guess, add up all the figures you know I'm giving and try to figure it out. Uh, 50 was traumatic for me. I didn't mind uh, 65, but 50 was really traumatic. The country was about 200 at the time, and one day it hit me, I'm one-fourth as old as the United States. <laughs> I was on my way to Australia, and as you know, you cross the international date line, and I had my 50th birthday twice. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. I've got a very encouraging wife. We'll be married 46 years tomorrow. Uh, thank you. And she said, honey, don't be discouraged. You're going to live to be 100. And I said, how do you know? She said, you look half dead already. Uh, so with that encouragement, I've been pressing on to my second half century here. We have six children, three boys and three girls. It's called Planned Parenthood. It's very difficult to make them come out even, as you may know, especially if you have seven or five. We decided to name all of the children from the Bible. R's for the girls and D's for the boys. Ruth, Rhoda, and Rachel were doing fine. We had Rebecca in case we had another girl. And then David, Daniel, and the third boy came along. We said, what's another good name for a boy from the Bible that begins with D? David, Daniel, Demetrius, Diotrephes, <laughs> Demas, devil. We thought that several times. So we called him Paul. Uh, just kind of dropped the line on the D. Uh, eeny, meeny, miny, and Henry didn't want no mo. Uh, we had so many children, I was afraid to come home and say, what's new, dear? Uh, <laughs> glad you have a sense of humor. Uh, my topic this evening is um, a topic that I am very much interested in, and I understand that many of you are too. And it's titled, Five Reasons Why I Am Not a Five-Point Calvinist. Five Reasons Why I Am Not a Five-Point Calvinist. A man died, went to heaven, and he saw two lines. One line said, predestined, and the other line said, free choice. So being a good five-point Calvinist, he got in the predestined line. And he worked his way up to the front, and the angel in charge said, why are you in this line? He said, well, I, I chose to be here. He said, well, it's the wrong line. The free choice line is over there. So he moved over to the other line. And he worked his way to the front of the line, and the angel at the desk said, what are you doing in this line? He said, somebody made me come here. <laughs> Predestination <laughs> and free will. It's probably one of the oldest problems um, in the history of theology. God predestined us. Do we freely choose it? What's the relationship between the two? The debate broke out right after the Reformation when Martin Luther and John Calvin and other theologians took a stand against many of the excesses they perceived in the Roman Catholic Church and stood on great fundamental principles like the Bible alone and grace alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, that word alone being the crucial difference between Roman Catholics and Protestants. Inside of the Protestant 
uh, faith, there were differences of opinion on this very issue. And I want to say tonight that with all uh, due respect, this is an intramural debate. People on both sides are good and godly people. People on both sides believe all of the fundamentals of the faith, the virgin birth and the deity of Christ and the substitutionary atonement, the bodily resurrection, the second coming. People on both sides of this issue believe all of those alones, salvation by grace alone and faith alone through Christ alone, based on the Bible alone. But it is an important topic because it does bear on several very important doctrines that the Bible teaches. And so I'd like to share with you why I don't come out on the side of what's called the five-point Calvinist. Now, five-point Calvinism comes from the Dutch context. And uh, in the Dutch context, as you know, tulip is a very important flower. And so we use the acrostic of a tulip. And the five points are T, uh, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, and P, perseverance of the saints. So that little acrostic tulip will be the five points of our message. And I'll explain each point, and then I'll look at some scripture and try to tell you why, on the basis of Scripture, that I do not accept or believe that that particular point, as understood by the extreme Calvinist, is correct. Let's begin with a Scripture in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Uh, and this we will be a five-point uh, Calvinist. Ephesians chapter 2, they appeal to this verse in support of their belief that man is so totally depraved, so totally sinful, so totally apart from God, that he cannot even understand the gospel or receive the gospel. He's dead, Ephesians 2, 1 says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, who were by nature the children of wrath. And these God made alive, verse 5, he made us alive. So there we were, dead in sin, like a dead corpse floating on the water, that could not hear, could not see, could not understand, and could not believe. But God in his grace, according to a five-point Calvinist, reached down and gave life to that corpse. Now that giving life is called regeneration. Giving life to the soul, imparting to a dead person life. And according to five-point Calvinism, we are so dead in our sins then we can't even understand the gospel. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he understand them, because they're spiritually discerned. So Ephesians 2.1, 1 Corinthians 2.14, become part of the basis for this belief that we're so totally depraved that the only way we could possibly get saved is if God made us alive first and then after we are made alive then we are capable of believing and that faith follows salvation faith is not the condition by which we get salvation salvation is the means by which we get faith now having thus explained what the five-point Calvinist means by the T in tulip I would like to tell you why I do not believe in the T of tulip as defined by the extreme Calvinist. I do not believe it because if you look at the context of this verse in Ephesians 2, you will notice in verse uh, 8 that it says that this is received through faith, for by grace you have been saved through faith. 
Now, if you're saved through faith, then what comes first, logically? The salvation or the faith? If you're saved by faith, faith comes before the salvation, right? Whereas the five-point Calvinist believes that salvation, regeneration, comes before faith. Romans 5.1 says, we are justified by faith. So faith is the means by which we get justification. Justification is not the means by which we get faith. One of the things I teach is philosophy, and one of the main modern philosophers was called Rene Descartes. And he said, I think, therefore I am. Well, actually, he got Descartes before De Horse, because <laughs> you have to exist before you can think. I exist, therefore I can think. I don't exist because I can think. I think because I exist. So I think the five-point Calvinist has Descartes before De Horse. Uh, you have to believe in order to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say, wait to get zapped by God. You're just dead, corpse. Wait to get zapped by God, and once you're saved, then you'll be able to believe. I find that nowhere in the New Testament. Everywhere I find the opposite, that we believe in order to receive salvation. We do not receive salvation in order to believe. Say, so, well, how do you explain the fact that they're dead? The Bible says that we're dead in trespass and sins. Dead can be understood two ways. Annihilation or separation. Now, we know in the Bible, death is not understood as annihilation, that you're totally taken right out of existence, as it were. Death in the Bible means separation. The prophet said, your sins have separated you from your God. Death brings a wall of separation. When we die, what happens? The soul separates from the body, absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5. It's far better to depart and be with Christ, Philippians 1, 23. Or in the book of Genesis, it says uh, she was die her soul was in the process of departing before she died. So death is understood in the Bible as separation, not annihilation. But for all practical purposes, the five-point Calvinist understands it as spiritual annihilation. That we're not uh, spiritually there in any sense of the term. We can't even understand the message or receive the message. And so God has to give life where we were totally, as it were, uh, departed uh, from him. No, the Bible says that death is separation from God and that we are separated as beings still in his image and likeness. In Genesis 9, 6, it says that even unsaved people are still in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27 says God created man in his own image. Yes, man fell. Yes, he sinned. Yes, he separated from God. But he separated from God. He still had God's image. Because after the flood, Noah was told, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he him. In other words, don't kill an unsaved person because they're still in the image of God. James 3.9 says it's wrong to curse another human being because they're made in the image of God. So the image of God is effaced in fallen man, but it's not erased. For all practical purposes, the five-point Calvinist says the image of God is erased. It's not there. You're so dead that there's no capacity left there to understand or receive the message of God's grace. Not the receiver. The receiver is the beggar who takes the hand out from God saying, I am poor. I am impoverished in myself, and I am dependent on God's grace. Thank you for this gracious gift of salvation. So T, total depravity, is misunderstood by the five-point Calvinists. U, unconditional election, is understood. Because it is unconditional from the standpoint of the giver but it is not unconditional from the standpoint of the receiver. You must accept it 
or you will be lost. Let's turn to one of the most important ones now in the acrostic tulip, and that's L, limited atonement. Limited atonement, very simply put, is this. Christ did not die for and pay the penalty for the sins of all mankind. Christ died only for some people called the elect, those who will be saved, those whom God chose from the foundation of the world. In fact, the doctrine of limited atonement is held by the traditional five-point Calvinist, and that the reason I call them extreme is because John Calvin himself did not hold this view. Uh, look at our book, Chosen But Free. There's a whole appendix in the book of quotes from Calvin where he said, Christ died for the sins of all mankind repeatedly over and over. So if you're more extreme than John Calvin, I would assume you should be called an extreme Calvinist, right? The moderate view is this. For God so loved the world. Jesus died for the whole world. Now just to show you how somebody's theological beliefs can act as a pair of glasses, and they look through it and they look right at a text that's saying something else, and they don't see it. When the extreme Calvinist looks at these verses, I'm going to quote to you. He takes the word all, or the word world, always to mean some. For example, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, on face value, you would assume that that means God loves everybody, right? Not for the extreme Calvinist. That means God only loved the elect world. He only loved the saved world. Now, in interpreting the Bible, that's called eisegesis, reading into the text, not reading out of the text, exegesis. Exegesis is what does the text mean in its context. That's getting the meaning out of the Bible. Eisegesis is reading your theology into the Bible, not being able to see what it says. Take a look at these verses and you tell me what they mean. If in John 3.16, God so loved the world. In Romans chapter 5, very famous passage beginning with verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now how many people in the world are ungodly? Just the elect or the whole world? If the whole world is ungodly and Christ died for the ungodly, then does it not follow logically that Christ died for the whole world? Or turn over a couple more chapters here to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told by the Apostle Paul that Christ died for all. Take a look at 5.14, 2 Corinthians. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. Now how somebody can look at this text and say that Christ died only for some, I do not understand. I do not understand how somebody without a pair of colored glasses called his theological system can look at a verse that says all and say it means some. How they can look at a verse that says the whole world and say it only means some of the world. It even gets stronger. Let's take a look at a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The five-point Calvinist says that Christ died only for some people. The Bible says he died for all. 1 Timothy 2.4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. Now there's one rule in interpreting the Bible. It's a very simple one. All means all, and that's all all means. All means all, and that's all that all means. If it says God desires all people to be saved, if he meant that he only desired some people to be saved, guess what he would have said? 
God desires some people to be saved. I mean, the word is there in Greek and in every language. It doesn't say some. It says all. And all means all. And that's all that all means. Turn over to another verse in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Peter is making it very clear that God wants everybody to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9. He's talking, verse 1, to uh, the church there, and he's talking about the last days and people who are saying, where is the promise of his coming, and who are unbelievers and who are perishing and so forth. And in verse 9 he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now I ask you very simply, how many people does God want to be saved, according to this verse? Some people, just the elect, or does God really want everybody to be saved? Very clearly, he wants everybody in the world to be saved. And if they aren't saved, what is the reason? Because they perceived but didn't receive. They knew it was true, but they refused to accept the truth. Christ came unto his own, but they were unwilling to receive him. Turn over to 1 John, the next book. Chapter 2, nothing could be clearer. My little children, verse 1, nothing could be clearer. My little children, verse 1, I write these things to you that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now get this. And he himself is the satisfaction, propitiation means satisfaction, for our sins. And not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Whose sins did Christ die for? Just ours? Just the elect? Or for those of the whole world? Now, the traditional five-point Calvinist says, he means Christian world here. I don't know what our means in contrast to them, if that's the case, but more than that, how do you interpret what somebody means by a word? You look at the context. You look at the broader context. Look down to verse 15 in the same chapter where John begins to define what he means by world. He couldn't possibly mean Christian world because he says, do not love the world. Does that mean that we're not supposed to love the elect? Absolutely not. Then he defines world, verse 16. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Couldn't mean the elect because he puts the world as opposed to God. The elect are not those opposed to God. From beginning to end, the New Testament teaches, indeed the whole Bible, that God so loved the world. And for the extreme Calvinist to say, in L, limited atonement, that Christ died only for some people, that Christ did not die for all people, is one, contrary to the Bible, and two, is contrary to the nature of God as love. One of the things the Bible teaches us about God is that he is all loving. Even the five-point Calvinist believes that God is all just, that he's so just that he can't look on sin. It's impossible for God to lie. Habakkuk 1.13 says he can't even look with approval on sin. Uh, Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for him to utter falsehoods. Titus 1.2 God who cannot lie, uh, Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. The Bible says that there's some things that God just can't do. His nature will not allow him. His nature will not allow him to overlook sin. 
he is all just and he must punish because of that. The Bible also says that God by nature is love. Now, if God by nature is all just because he is just and he must be all just, then God by nature must be all loving because he is love. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Not he has love or he has love for some. If he is all loving, and mark this down, he must love all. You cannot be all loving and just love some. One night, a friend of mine invited an extreme Calvinist and myself to a dinner party after we had a lovely meal. Uh, the discussion for the evening was the five points of Calvinism. He represented the traditional view, and I represented what is called the moderate view that I've been describing to you. Near the end of the discussion, when we were on this point, I said to him, uh, let's call him Pastor John, I said, Pastor John, tell me this, does God love everybody or does he only love the elect? And without batting an eyelash, he said, God only loves some people. He just loves the elect. Now, I'm trying to be kind in my reaction here, but that is an insult to the nature of God. That is an insult to the nature of God. To say that God just loves some people is to make God arbitrary, is to make God capricious, is to make God more like an Arabian chick than the God of Scripture, is to make God more like the God of the Quran, whom Omar Khayyam, the famous Persian poet, said, "'Tis all a checkerboard of night and days, where destiny with men as pieces plays, hither and thither, checks and mates and slays, and one by one back in the closet lays." That is not the God of the Bible. That's the God of Islam, who is so sovereign that he can act contrary to his very nature if he wishes. If he wants, he can just love some people and hate other people. The God of the Bible, by his very nature, must love all. You cannot be all loving and not love all people. That leads us to a very important illustration, one that my traditional Calvinist friends don't like, but they don't really know what to do with except to make it more powerful illustration than I did to begin with. Here is what a five-point Calvinist really believes. He really believes that it's like this. A farmer had a pond, and the neighborhood boys were wont to swim there, and he didn't want them to drown, so he put up a fence and put up a sign, don't swim. One day he was driving back in his field. Three neighborhood boys were in the pond drowning. The farmer pulled up on his tractor. He folded his arms. He pointed up to the sign and said, the sign says, don't trespass, don't swim here. You're swimming here, you're drowning, you deserve to drown. He folded his arms and watched all three boys drown. Now, would anyone say that that was a loving three boys drown? Now, would anyone say that that was a loving person? I think not. That's precisely what the five-point Calvinist believes God can and could have done. Because God gave his law, we disobeyed his law, and we all deserve to go to hell, and God didn't have to try to save anyone. Now, they're half right. The half they're right on is God is just, God has a law, we disobey his law, and we justly take the consequences of our sin. Half right. But the other half is a tragic error. While they're half right, 
in emphasizing that God is just and those people are justly condemned. They are totally wrong in saying that God is not so loving that he doesn't want to do anything about it and try and rescue those people. And any farmer who had a fence and a sign like that and would stand there and watch three people drown may be all just, but he's not all loving. The God of the Bible is both. But, the extreme Calvinist says, what he actually happened was this. Everything in the story is the same, up to the point he sees the three boys, and he says to them, you saw the sign, you're justly drowning, uh, but uh, you in the blue suit, and he throws a rope to one of the three and pulls him in, folds his arms, and watches the other two drown. It's exactly what the traditional five-point Calvinist believes. I confess to you that neither do I find this in the Bible, for all the reasons we gave, God loves all, and neither in the depth of my heart, made in his image with a moral sensitivity, can I believe that such a God, such a God, is a God worthy of our commitment. Because a God who is not all loving is not worthy of all our love. A God who says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. A God who says, I am love and who tells me that he loves only some people and that he wouldn't even try to rescue the other two is not an all-loving God. Here's what I think really happened. Everything in the story is the same, up to the point where the farmer says, you saw the sign, you disobeyed it, you're drowning, at which point the farmer throws a rope to all three boys and he does everything he can to rescue them. One person accepts the rope, and the other two say, no thanks, I can do it myself, and drown. The Bible says God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But God sent Christ to die for all of mankind. That the Holy Spirit has come into the world, John 16 and convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. That God sent a rope to everybody, and he tries to get everybody to be saved. But there are some people who refuse, who refuse to accept. And because God is loving, he can't force himself on people who won't accept his love. That leads us to I, irresistible grace. T-U-L-I. Irresistible grace, according to the traditional Calvinist, goes like this. God can use so much power on people that he can overpower them, and he can save anybody he wants to save, even against their will. And that he exercises his saving grace just on some people, in spite of the fact that they're dead and in rebellion against him, he uses overpowering and irresistible grace to save just some people. Now, there are two things wrong with this. One, he only uses it on some people. If he had it, and this is why I believe that the early Puritanism, which was five-point Calvinism, eventually paved the way for Unitarian and Universalism in America, because if you put these two premises together, tell me what you get. God can save anyone he wants to, even against their will. That's what they believe, irresistible grace. God loves everybody and wants to save everybody. But what's the conclusion of those two premises? Everybody's going to be saved. Because if God can save anyone he wants, even against their will, and he is all loving and he wants to save everyone, then everybody is going to get saved. So extreme Calvinism leads to universalism, and the Bible teaches universalism is false. Everybody's not going to be saved. There's a devil and the angels are going to hell, and there's everyone who rejects Christ is going to hell. Everybody's not going to make it. Let me give you a verse and a quote from C.S. Lewis. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. 
In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is pleading with Jerusalem. He's saying to them in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Now notice these next five words. But you were not willing. I wanted to save all of you. I love all of you. I sent the Holy Spirit to convict all of you. But you were not willing. That tells me two very important things about this universe in which we live. There is a loving God and there are free creatures. And that love can never force someone to do something against their free choice. Suppose a young man loves a young lady and he says to her, I love you, I want to marry you, will you marry me? And she says, no, I respect you, I like you, but I'm not interested in marrying you. And he says to the young lady, well, I love you so much, please marry me. And he begs and pleads and persuades and he courts her and gives her gifts and flowers and he says, please marry. And she said, I told you, I do not want to get married and please don't press the issue any further. And the young man gets frustrated and he says to her, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to love me. You say, oops, forced love is not love. Forced love is rape. And as I understand it, in all due respect, God, perish the thought, is not a divine rapist. He works only persuasively on people, never coercively. God will never force you to do something against your will. And yet, I, irresistible grace, by the five-point Calvinist says, God will force you to do things against your will. To do things against your will. Not the God of the Bible. Not the God who is love. Because love never forces itself on anyone else. C.S. Lewis said this in his great book called The Great Divorce about heaven and hell. He said, in the end, there are only two kinds of people in the world. One says, thy will be done, O God. The other one, God says to them, thy will be done. Now in the end, when this service is all, service is all over, and you're given a chance to respond to this wonderful grace of God that he loved everyone. There are only two kinds of people in this building. One says, thy will be done, O God. And the other one, God says, have it your way. Thy will be done. That's the way it is in a free universe with a loving God. Because love can't force someone against their will. Love has to respect the will of the other. In uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, Milton puts some profound words in the mouth of Satan. Satan says, quote, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. You got the same choice that Satan had. You want to reign in hell? You want to have it your way? God will say, you got it. Or you want to serve in heaven. It's either thy will be done or thy will be done. Irresistible grace is contrary to the nature of God as love. Irresistible grace is contrary to the nature of human beings as free. In fact, very clearly the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 that the grace of God can be resisted. You remember Stephen the first Christian martyr. And in Acts chapter uh, 7, we read in verse 51, 
that he spoke to the people who were hard-hearted against Christ and said, 751, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. God allows us to resist his love, for if he didn't, he couldn't be loving. He would have to force it down our throats. Now, there's a passage that's often used by the extreme Calvinist. I want you to turn there. It's in Romans chapter 9, because this is their stronghold. This is the verse they fall back on when they say that God's grace is irresistible. Romans chapter 9, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Verse 20. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me thus? Verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his power and wrath to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now, well, this passage is a very strong passage in the Bible, and many people have great difficulty with it. Let me try and help you through the difficulty of this passage. First of all, verse 13. Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Sounds like a strong Calvinistic God, doesn't it? it says, sounds like God loves some people and hates other people. Look in the margin of your Bible, if you have a cross-reference system, and see what God is talking about. 9.13 in the margin of my Bible says Malachi 1.2. He's not talking about the individual Jacob and the individual Esau before they were born and say, I hated one, I loved the other, I predestined one to heaven, I predestined one to hell. He's not saying that. He's talking about the nation Jacob, Israel, and the nation Esau, which was Edom. And he's talking after they had lived and after Edom had done all those evil things to try and kill and uh, detour his people from their redemptive purpose. And God said, I hate that. He didn't hate the individual, Jacob. He didn't hate the person, Jacob. He hated the nation, Edom, for their evil deeds against Israel. It's not talking about predestination of an individual. Secondly, he's talking about predestination or choice for an earthly purpose, not for a heavenly destiny. He's talking about why did God set apart his people Israel, and then is going to re-graft them as a nation back in. He's not talking about individual predestination. He's talking about corporate election of a nation for a temporal purpose of bringing in the eternal Savior. Furthermore, if you look at this phrase, Esau have I hated, you will find out that the phrase in the Bible, hated, really means loved less. It doesn't mean hate. Remember what Jesus said, if a man loves his father and mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. And then he went on to say, unless a man hates his father and mother, well, now, love more and love less and hate seem to us to be two different things. Not so in the Hebrew idiom. To hate meant to love less. Turn back to the book of Genesis for a proof of that. In the book of Genesis, you remember the story in Genesis chapter 29. The context here is about Jacob loving Rachel. And in Genesis 29, verse 30, it says, Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. So get the phrase, he loved one of these sisters more than the other. Then verse 31, and the Lord saw that Leah was, now in the King James, in many translations, it correctly translates it, hate. In the New King James, which most of us have, it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, it's the word for hate. So the Lord saw that Leah was hated is used in parallel to Rachel was loved more. Hate means to love less. Why did God love Edom less? Because of their evil deeds. 
can't love them less because he didn't want them to be saved, didn't want them to go to heaven. Hate, in the context of Romans 9, means love less. And it means love less to this corporate group of people, a nation, not to an individual. Loving overtures to reach you will make you more hard. Not because he's trying to make you hard, he's trying to soften you, but because your rejection of it will become even more emphatic the more he tries. Let me illustrate it by the sun. The same sun that melts wax hardens clay. What's the difference? The sun or the agent receiving the softening rays of the sun? If you are receptive like wax to God's love, it will soften your heart. If you are hard and reject that, the same love will turn you the other way. Do you ever pet a kitten and it purrs? And suppose you turn the other way and you're still petting it and the kitten turns around and you're rubbing its fur the wrong way. Did you stop giving loving strokes? No. The kitten turned in the wrong direction. And the love of God to somebody who wants to receive it will make them purr. But the love of God to somebody who's turned in the wrong direction will rub their fur the wrong way. God loves everybody. P. Perseverance of the saints. I don't have long to uh, linger on this point. But the extreme Calvinist believes that if you are elect, that you will persevere to the end, that you will ultimately be saved because whomever God regenerates will ultimately be saved. And the way, and this is the crucial thing, the way that you will know that you are elect is if you are faithful to his law unto the end. And if you are unfaithful to his law and you slip into sin, that's a proof that you were not one of the elect. So they believe that all of the elect are secure, but really nobody has full assurance that they're one of the elect. Because the only way you can know you're one of the elect is if you endure unto the end and are faithful to his law. I heard two great five-point Calvinists, whose names you would know if I mentioned them, give almost the same message. And here's what they said. One of them uh, believed in flying airplanes. The other one didn't, but neither of them would fly on Sunday because they believed it was a violation of the Sabbath. And they believed we were still under the Sabbath law of the Old Testament. That's another story. Paul said we're not under the law, we're under grace. That which was engraven in stones has faded away, 2 Corinthians 3. But that's another story for another day. Here's what they said. If they took an airplane ride on Sunday after living their entire life serving the Lord and took an airplane ride on Sunday which is violating the Sabbath and the plane crashed and they died, that proves that they were not one of the elect. No assurance of salvation. The Bible says, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Bible says, he has begun a good work, and you will perfect it, perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, no one can pluck us out of his hand, John chapter 10, verses 26 and following. The Bible says, that nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. The Bible says that right now you can be persuaded that you can have assurance that you're a child of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. But for the extreme Calvinists, there is no assurance of salvation. There is security for the elect, but there's no assurance that they're one of the elect. Many of the great Puritan divines, as they approach death, uh, trembled because they weren't sure that they had been faithful enough. Second, I have good news for you. Second Timothy chapter 2. If we are faithless, he is faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You can be absolutely sure right now, tonight, that you're a child of God. Because as many as received him, to them gave he power 
to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. T-U-L-I-P, TULIP, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. They strike out on all five, five reasons why I am not a five-point Calvinist. But let me give you one reason why I believe what the Bible says. God is love. God loves all. God wants you to receive his love. Christ died for you. There's not a five-point Calvinist on the face of the earth who can consistently look at any unsaved person and say, Jesus loves you and died for you. Why? He doesn't know whether he's one of the elect. You can't go up to an unsaved person and say, Christ loved you, Christ died for you. Well, I've got great news for you. I can look every one of you in the eye and say, Jesus loves you. Christ died for you. Christ wants you to be saved. But I can also tell you, he's not going to force you. Oh, Jerusalem, how often, but you were unwilling. Tonight, I hope you're willing to receive him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for your love, your unconditional love. Thank you that Christ loved us and gave himself for us. My heart goes out tonight. For people who may be here standing under Niagara Falls of God's love with their cup upside down, help them to join us who have turned our cup right side up and who are saying, my cup is full and running over. And may no one go away tonight empty, holding their cup upside down under the Niagara of your love, but persuade them to freely turn it up and to receive you. In Jesus' name, amen.